Hello, fellow followers of Christ, and welcome to the show that introduces you to the men and women behind history's greatest works of literature. Come along every week as we explore these renowned authors, the times and genre in which they wrote, why scholars praise their writing, and how we as Catholics should read and understand their works. I'm Joseph Pierce, and this is The Authority. Hello and welcome to this episode of The Authority. I'm your host, Joseph Pierce. Thanks as always for joining me. Uh, and today we're going to be looking at a writer who's not as well known as he should be. And it's uh, in order to rectify somewhat that sin of omission that we are focusing on him today. The writer in question is Maurice Baring. I think Americans normally pronounce the name Maurice, but I'm sorry, I, I can't do that. Uh, so Maurice Baring, uh, B-A-R-I-N-G. Now, the best way of, of, of finding out where he fits um, is to take a visual image. Uh, there's a very uh, uh, famous painting by a, a marvelous artist called Sir James Gunn. A little bit about him first. So James Gunn uh, was a Scottish artist um, who, who, who uh, painted in the realist tradition, and um, uh, amongst other things, wrote, he painted portraits of the royal family um, in, the, in the late 1940s, when sort of Princess Elizabeth, before she becomes Queen Elizabeth II, for instance, as a young lady in some of these group portraits of the royal family. Um, he was a convert to Catholicism uh, himself and is actually buried in the same graveyard as Hilaire Belloc um, in uh, the, the, the Church of Our Lady of Consolation in, um, in Sussex. But he, he painted, a, uh, as he was a friend of Belloc's and Chesterton's and Morris Baring, he actually got the three of them together. Uh, and uh, painted a, a painting called uh, uh, The Conversation Piece. And it shows Chesterton uh, seated at a table, at a large table, mm. writing something on a piece of paper. And standing behind him uh, are Hilaire Belloc and Maurice Baring. So we often see Chesterton and Belloc together. Um, uh, George Bernard Shaw dubbed Chesterton and Belloc as being seen so much as being synonymous, as being alike in in what they believed and what they wrote about, that they are like two halves of a pantomime elephant, you know, the, 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 the Chester Belloc. Uh, and really, Be Morris Baring deserves to be part of that. Um, um, I don't know what, 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 what name you could come up with, the Chester Belloc Baring or something, but the three of them are a triumvirate. They, 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 they're three people that, 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 that were very important to, to Catholic letters, to Catholic literature, uh, especially between the two world wars. And that's really where Maurice Baring's uh, fame resides in what he wrote between the two world wars. But before we get there, uh, I, I, I want to backtrack to his earlier life. But, but the, the point is that although Maurice Baring is now seen as being in the shadow of Belloc and Chesterton, that was not the case. And between the two world wars, he was a best-selling novelist in the UK in France and in other uh, countries that he was very much seen as a, as a significant and, and well-known author in his own right. It's very sad that in the post-war years, he's been largely neglected. And there were some reasons for that, which we'll discuss. But probably, actually, let's begin with it, actually, with the, the most important reason why he why he's neglected is because of his extraordinary depth of culture. This man was so widely read, not just in uh, the literature of the English language, but he spoke uh, essentially fluently, uh, very comfortably, both reading and speaking uh, Greek, Latin, Russian, uh, Danish, one of the Scandinavian languages, French. German, um, so uh, I think Italian. So he, he was a polyglot uh, man who just picked up languages. He worked for the diplomatic service um, when he was a young man. Uh, obviously, a man so gifted in languages. So he spent uh, time in Copenhagen. So yeah, Danish would be the language uh, as a diplomat. Uh, he worked uh, in Russia. Um, so and he's just so widely read. Uh, so what I feel uh, when I read Maurice Baring, he, he's a challenge to read. He's difficult. 
but you know this is a challenge to which we should rise, uh, rise to the challenge. But I think about him, what Chesterton said about uh, his friend, uh, the, the Dominican um, Father Vincent McNabb. Chesterton said, Chesterton said of Father Vincent McNabb, referring to Father McNabb's holiness, that he walks on a crystal floor above my head. Uh, and that's what I feel when I read Bering, not so much his holiness, but his depth of culture. You know, he'll quote foreign languages and not normally bother to translate for us because he's sort of assuming his readers will, not, will be as knowledgeable in languages as he is. So you have to be prepared when you read them to not understand, not get everything, uh, but to allow yourself to grow into sort of the, 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 shall we say, the aesthetic literary cathedral, which he is, uh, and, 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 and to grow through the, being in his presence. So for me, he does, uh, as a writer and as a man of culture, walk a, on a crystal floor above my head. Uh, as regards his conversion uh, to Catholicism, he's featured in my book, Literary Converse, and I'm going to read the passage about his uh, early views on Catholicism and where they led. So dating back to 1899, so he's almost exactly the same age as Chesterton. Uh, uh, Chesterton and, and, and Bering were both born in 1874. Um, Bering would outlive Chesterton and die in 1945. Chesterton died in 1936. This goes back to 1899. So we have a, a, a young Morris Bering in his mid-twenties. I'm just going to read from the book here for the moment. Even at this stage, however, Bering understood the logic of the Catholic position, telling Reggie Balfour, Quote, my trouble is I cannot believe in the first proposition, the source of all dogma. If I could do that, in other words, the, 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 the existence of God, if I could do that, if I could tell the first lie, I quite see that all the rest would follow. In spite of his unbelief, he accompanied Balfour to a low mass at Notre Dame de, de Victoire. He had never attended a low mass before and he was pleasantly surprised. Quote, it impressed me greatly. I had imagined Catholic services were always long, complicated, and overlaid with ritual. A low mass, I found, was short, extremely simple, and somehow or other made me think of the catacombs and the meetings of the early Christians. One felt one was looking on at something extremely ancient. The behaviour of the congregation and the expression on their faces impressed me too. To them, it was evidently real. End quote. There was a potent postscript to this episode, which perhaps had as much to do with Bering's eventual conversion as anything Belloc may have discussed with him. When Reggie Balfour returned to London, he sent Bering an epitaph translated from the French into English. I'm going to... Uh, <laughs> Uh, endeavour to read this in the original French, so I, I, I'm probably going to butcher it. So for you French speakers out there, apologies in advance. Sigit Robert Péchon, Robert Péchon, anglais, catholique, qui après le rupture de l'Angleterre avec l'Église, et quitté l'Angleterre, ne pouvant y vivre sans la foi, et qui venu à Rome, et est mort, ne pouvant y vivre sans patrie. So even if you could speak French with that appalling rendition, you still probably don't know what I'm saying. So <laughs> I will translate it. Here lies Robert Peckham, Englishman and Catholic, who after England's break with the church, left England, not being able to live without the faith, and who, coming to Rome, died, not being able to live without his country. The epitaph is to be found in the Church of San Gregorio in Rome, and its underlying tradition produced a marked and lasting effect on Bering's whole view of the Reformation. He always possessed a melancholy nature, and such imagery provided the inspiration for many of his novels. More specifically, the epitaph itself provided the starting point for his writing of the historical novel Robert Peckham, 30 years later. It is worth noting that Bering, by the beginning of 1902, was to be as emotionally affected by the Catholic High Mass 
however long, complicated and overlaid with ritual it may be, as he had been by the low mass at Notre Dame de Victoire. In February 1902, he was in Rome when Pope Leo XIII celebrated his jubilee. He went to high mass at St Peter's and witnessed the Pope being carried in on his chair, blessing the crowd. Quote, I had a place under the dome. At the elevation of the host, the papal guard went down on one knee and their halberds struck the marble floor with one sharp, thunderous rap. And presently the silver trumpets rang out in the dome. At that moment I looked up and my eye caught the inscription written in large letters all around it. To S. Petrus. And I reflected the prophecy had certainly received a most substantial and concrete, concrete fulfilment. The solemnity and the majesty of the spectacle were indescribable, especially as the pallor of the Pope's face seemed transparent, as if the veil of flesh between him and the other world had been refined and attenuated to the utmost and to an almost unearthly limit. Emotionally, Bering now felt a deep attraction to Catholicism, but intellectually he was still unable to believe. At the beginning of January 1900, he wrote to Ethel Smith, as a friend, actress friend, I wish we were all born Roman Catholics. I believe in their spirit and refuse to acknowledge their exclusive supremacy of their church. End quote. Later the same year, when Bering was cycling in the countryside with Smith, she said to him, that she believed he would someday become a Catholic. At the time, he had treated her prediction with incredulity, believing that nothing was more impossible. Later, after her prophecy had been realised, he told her it was, it was an example of her miraculous intuition. Several months later still, Bering wrote to another friend, George Graham, stating that, for me, there are only two alternatives – agnosticism, practically atheism, or RCs, Roman Catholics. He wrote again a few days later, espousing his own personal theory on the whole issue. This time, he seems to have arrived at intellectual as well as emotional assent. Quote, No one who has ever punched Roman Catholicism and who is religious and believes in Christianity has ever not embraced it at once. Newman arrived at the conclusion purely a priori. He had a spirit of hate for Catholics and had never been inside a Catholic church. Most people don't punch it at all and say, oh, priests and idolatry. But, however, bad priests are, but, however bad priests are doesn't affect the quote, question of is the Roman church the Catholic and apostolic church of the creed or is the Anglican? And I think emphatically the Roman is and the Anglican is not. In December 1900, he finally arrived at a position where his intellect conformed with his emotions, his head with his heart. He wrote to Hubert Cornish, describing how he had changed during the previous 12 months. Previously, he had been quite unable to perform the acrobatic feat, the leap of faith required even to begin to contemplate conversion. But now, I start from the other side. I believe in Christianity. I believe in the redemption. Ironically, for one so different from Oscar Wilde in every way imaginable, Bering was also influenced by the return of uh, J.K. Huysmans to the church, French novelist. Quote, if you read En Route by Huysmans, his fight at the end with his reason is word for word what I have twice experienced, detail for detail. For Bering, although the fight with reason was all but over, it would take him the rest of the decade to make the decisive step into the church. In the intervening period, he battled not so much with great philosophical questions as with petty prejudices. In 1906, he told Belloc that he had despised Vatican politics and the effect of the church upon the body politic in Italy and France. He disliked the English Catholics in Rome and he had doubts about Catholic education. Three years later, he buried such doubts and embraced the faith. In the meantime, he would say with Huysmans that he was en route. Okay, so here we have uh, the beginnings of Bering's approach to the church. Uh, um, 
some years prior to his conversion. Um, before we talk about his 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 importance as a novelist, which is where his real literary importance resides, though I say that somewhat begrudgingly, and the reason I say it begrudgingly is I do think Maurice Baring is one of the finest poets of the 20th century. His poetry is unread and unknown, and, and that is, quite frankly, um, a crime. I have here a volume, which should be brought back into print one of these days, called Collected Poems by Maurice Baring. And I've got to read a part, you know, so I'll just give you, he also, I've got a bad wrist, so if, if I squirm occasionally, forgive me. Um, so he, he has a, 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 an ability in a, in a sonnet to encapsulate the spirit of a nation. So there's there's a sonnet on Germany, there's a sonnet on Italy, there's a sonnet on Seville, there's a sonnet on Greece, there's a sonnet on Russia. He spent some time in Russia. He was a, uh, a journalist reporting on the Russo-Japanese War in 1904. Um I'm going to resist the temptation of reading his marvellous sonnet on Russia, but he also wrote A June Night in Russia, Harvest in Russia. And then the other thing he has is this marvellous ability to encapsulate writers and composers in a sonnet form, their spirit. So there's a sonnet on Dostoevsky. There's a sonnet on Beethoven, on Mozart, on Shelley, Percy Shelley. Um, and there's a sonnet on Wagner, which I am going to read, um, Bearing, as well as being, being so widely read in the literature of so many languages, was very, very cultured in terms of the love of music. Uh, and he was a great devotee of the music of Wagner. And Wagner, of course, is a conflicted spirit. And this conflict, this, this tempestuous, tumultuous aspect of Wagner's personality uh, and his work is present in this sonnet. I am going to not resist the temptation. I am going to read it. Wagner by Maurice Berry. O oh, strange awakening to a world of gloom and baffled moonbeams and delirious stars of souls and moan behind forbidden bars and waving forests swept by wings of doom. Of heroes falling in unhappy fight and winged messengers from eeries dim and mountains ringed with flame and shapes that swim in the deep river's green translucent night. O oh, restless soul, forever seeking bliss, a thirst forever and unsatisfied. Whether the woodland starts to the echoing horn or dying Tristram moans by shores forlorn or Siegfried rise through fire to wake his bride and shakes the whirling planets with a kiss. But probably closer to home as regards the, 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 the authority and, and the Christian dimension, he wrote a wonderful uh, uh, sonnet called Candlemas. Uh, he was received in the church at Candlemas, February the 2nd, um, um, the Feast of the Purification, of course. Um, and there's a wonderful sonnet, which I will resist reading. Um, but uh, he wrote also a poem called Vita Nuova, uh, meaning new life, it's a sonnet sequence of three sonnets to commemorate his reception to the church on, on that candle mass. And I'm going to read the middle of the three sonnets in this sonnet sequence, which uh, encapsulates his emotions at the time of his conversion. One day I heard a whisper, wherefore wait? Why linger in a separated porch? Why nurse the flicker of a severed torch? The fire is there, ablaze beyond the gate. Why tremble, foolish soul? Why hesitate? However faint the knock, it will be heard. I knocked and swiftly came the answering word, which bade me enter to my own estate. I found myself in a familiar place, and there my broken soul began to mend. I knew the smile of every long-lost face. They whom I had forgotten remembered me. I knelt, I knew, it was too bright to see the welcome of a king who was my friend. All right. So during World War One, we've uh, we've looked at some of the the uh, World War 
one poets and there's some war poetry about the russell japanese war, war. Um, there's a sonnet on a, the dead samurai but uh but but bearing's role in the in world war one was with the the new regiment within the british army called the royal flying corps this of course the early days of of the existence of airplanes of the of of, of the technology of flight um, and so at this point, there was not the Royal Air Force. By World War II, of course, it would be the Royal Air Force, a separate department of the military. But the Royal Flying Corps was merely a corps of the army. And he was uh, um, uh, served in the Royal Flying Corps during World War I and actually wrote a book about it called RFCHQ, I think, if I remember correctly. But it was say, let's now move on to bearing as a novelist. Uh his first novel was published in 1921, was called Passing By, and his final novel, Darby and Joan, was published in 1935. Twelve uh, novels in total during that period of 14 years. Many of them are somewhat, well, several of them are somewhat substantial in terms of length. Um, and uh, there's the famous... Well, maybe we'll get to that a bit later. So Robert Peck, I've already spoken about. This is a historical novel. Reminds us somewhat of the novels of Robert Hugh Benson, a novel set during the time of uh, the persecution of Catholics, during the time of the English Reformation, the 16th and 17th century. Robert Peck is forced into exile. So the novel is set first in England and then in Rome. Cat's Cradle is a wonderful, long novel about um, uh, an aristocratic Catholic lady living amongst the expatriate community in Rome, um, so the English community in Rome. The Lonely Lady of Dulwich is another wonderful story. Bering has this marvellous ability to, to, to make his protagonist females, and um, women, a uh, somewhat unusual gift for many male novelists. Um, but his greatest, his greatest uh, um, novel, most people would agree, is C, just the letter C, and um, I wrote about this in the series for Crisis magazine, putting great literature in a nutshell. And I thought I would read this as to give you some inkling uh, into the sort of novelist that Morris Baring was. C is one of the longest works featured in this series, weighing in at over 700 pages, as well as having the shortest title. It is also neglected and little known, as is its author, Maurice Baring. It would be well, therefore, to say a little about the author and his importance before we proceed to what is arguably his final work. And although we talked a little bit about Maurice Baring's biography already, the way I discuss it here is somewhat different, so we will, we, we will go ahead. Maurice Baring was born in 1874, the same year as his good friend G.K. Chesterton. A convert to the faith, he was received into the church in 1909. Although he is a very fine poet, he is better known as a novelist. Between the two world wars, he wrote several popular and highly regarded novels. These include Robert Peckham, an historical novel set during the Tudor terror of the 16th century, and several novels set in contemporary England and Europe. Hilaire Belloc considered one of Baring's novels, Cat's Cradle, to be, quote, a great masterpiece, the best story of a woman's life that I know, end quote. G.K. Chesterton wrote that he had been much uplifted by Baring's novel, The Coat Without Seam, comparing it, quote, with much of the very good Catholic work now being done, especially in France. Francois Mauriac, one of the finest novelists of the Catholic literary revival in France, to which Chesterton was referring, was a great admirer of Baring's novels. What I most admire about Baring's work, Mauriac said, is the sense he gives you of the penetration of grace. Baring was too moved to speak when he learned of Mauriac's praise. Baring was inadvertently describing himself in the description of a character in The Coat Without Seam. Everything about him gave one the impression of centuries and hidden stores of pent-up civilization. Baring knew Latin, Greek, French, German, Italian, Russian and Danish, and he was widely read in the literature of all these languages. Reading his work is like stepping into the presence of someone who walks on a crystal floor of culture above our heads. Forgive the element of repetition. It's like a refrain in a song. It's worth, worth repeating. 
As the aforementioned quote by Moriac might suggest, Baring enjoyed great success in France. Ten of his books were translated into French, with one, Daphne, D Daphne Adina, going through 23 printings. His novels were also translated into Czech, Dutch, German, Hungarian, Italian, Spanish, and Swedish. C, published in 1924, received the highest of praise from the French novelist André Morois, who wrote that no book had given him such pleasure since his reading of Tolstoy, Proust, and certain novels by E.M. Forster. As we begin to discuss the novel, it might be good to start with an explanation of its title. C is the nickname given to the novel's protagonist, the Honourable Carol Bramsley, by his family and friends. The second son and fourth child of Lord and Lady Hengrave, C moves in an aristocratic world of opulence, high culture and low morals. A precocious child who struggles to ad adapt to adulthood, he is torn between the two types of love which are ever at war in the human heart. The first is the call to caritas, the sacrificing of the self for the beloved. The other is the pursuit of eros, the sacrificing of the beloved on the altar erected to the self. It is this war which wages itself relentlessly in C's own selfish heart. The higher calling of Caritas is epitomised by C's thwarted relationship with the aptly and symbolically named Beatrice. Meanwhile, his lower appetites hunger after the seductive and flirtatious Layla, the beautiful wife of a successful diplomat. On the surface, the religious element is present in the presence of Beatrice, a devout and virtuous Catholic, but the deepest spiritual dimension is subsumed within the very depths of cultural sensibility and a breathtaking breadth of intertextual interplay with which Bering breathes ethical and aesthetic life into the weavings and wanderings of the plot. We see how C's early infatuation with romantic poetry in general and the poetry of Shelley in particular impacts his philosophy of life and love. We see how his dabbling with the diabolism of the French decadence intoxicates his aesthetic sensibility, poisoning his innocence with the suggestive promises of pride. We see how his reading weakens and finally destroys his already weak and faltering Christian faith. We see how his descent into atheism is seen as a liberation of the spirit from the constraints of Christian morality. Throughout the novel, the music of Wagner provides a hauntingly recurring soundtrack, a leitmotif of doom-laden desire and gloom-laden desolation. I didn't actually quote from uh, a few lines from that sonnet on Wagner I've already read. This evokes the strange awakening to a world of gloom that the discovery of Wagner has on sea, a discovery that dooms him to the pursuit of dark and delirious delights, the fruit of which is frustration. Again, Bering Sonnet speaks to the novel's protagonist. O restless soul, forever seeking bliss, a thirst forever and unsatisfied. There is, however, a powerful antidote to this recurring Wagnerian siren call in the perennial metaphorical presence of Dante throughout the novel. Seeing this sublime and subliminal presence enables us to perceive the intertextual counterpoint that Dante's presence represents. With the beatific Beatrice providing the clue, we can see how C is a Dante figure who has allowed himself to wander into the dark wood of sin, a slave to his sinful appetites. And of course, insofar as C is a Dante figure in the context of Dante's character in the Divine Comedy, he is also an everyman figure and therefore a cautionary figure. C shows us ourselves or the selves we might become if we choose to pursue certain loves at the expense of others. The question that the novel asks and finally answers is whether C will respond to the higher call to which Beatrice beckons him or whether he will remain like Paolo in the Inferno, a restless soul forever seeking bliss a thirst forever and forever unsatisfied. In our uncivilized age, it is perhaps inevitable that the civilized brilliance of Morris Baring should have been eclipsed by the polluting smog of uncultured mediocrity. For as long as the light of civilization dwindles, 
so will the reputation of this most civilised of writers. One might hope that the inevitable de demise of burned-out nihilism will lead to a resurrection of all that is good, true and beautiful in literature. If such a resurrection happens, Morris Baring's work will once again be as widely read and enjoyed as once it was. Thanks so much as always for joining me uh, in The Authority. Please do join me next time. And until next time, goodbye, God bless, and good reading. This has been an episode of The Authority with Joseph Pierce, brought to you by TAN. For updates on new episodes and to support The Authority and other great free content, visit theauthoritypodcast.com to subscribe and use coupon code AUTHORITY25 to get 25% off your next order, including books, audiobooks, and video courses by Joseph Pierce on literary giants such as Tolkien, Chesterton, Lewis, Shakespeare, and Belloc, as well as Tan's extensive catalog of content from the saints and great spiritual masters to strengthen your faith and interior life. To follow Joseph and support his work, Check out his blog and sign up for email updates and exclusive content at jpierce.co. And thanks for listening.